about different tough times going on. Appreciate Danny sharing those. And the reality is we all go through times of crisis in our life, don't we? So those crises can be major sometimes. Those crises can, can be small. Uh, this past week, Heather is getting ready to host actually a group of uh, teachers from the elementary school at our house, kind of the end of the summer, beginning of the school year, kind of get together. And so I was trying to get my honey-do list done by getting the yard work done. And it was late Monday afternoon, Monday evening, and the boys were helping me in the middle of getting the backyard mowed, and the lawnmower just quit. And most of you know me well enough to say that I'm a mechanical type would not be accurate, right? So I, I did the first thing I thought to do. I called my lawnmower trouble buster man. I called Solomon Daniels, right? He came over and helped me out of, of that crisis and helped me to get through the situation. We did mention Danny and, and Jackie and family on the TLC list probably should have and talked about big events coming up this week. You know, they, they'd be praying for them too. There's a little big event coming up in their life this week, this Saturday, as Hillary and Eric are getting married Saturday. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying getting married is a crisis. I don't want anybody, Heather's in children's worship training, I don't want anybody running to tell Heather that I said getting married is a crisis. Um, but we all know that wedding ceremonies and getting prepared for those can be stressful, can't they? And a lot to think about and a lot going on. I'm going to be mindful of them and, of course, praying for them. We all have crisis in our life. Most of us go through days, don't go through days, without having some type of crisis in our life one way or the other, whether it is small or obviously we have those and those in this room going through crises that are, that are major and that are big. And we're mindful of that. This morning we're continuing our series. We started last week. We're calling Living in Babylon, in which we're looking at Daniel and also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they lived in Babylon, as we touched on last week, as they were brought over to Babylon as Babylon took over the Jews and Jews went into Babylon captivity and brought up there. And we doing a relatively short series with this. And I have to confess to you, I did not really plan on including chapter 2 in the series. Because to be honest with you, I was going to ignore all the chapters about visions in Daniel. Um, and we still are going to ignore most of the visions in Daniel. Okay, And even this in chapter 2, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, we're not going to read about the vision that King Nebuchadnezzar has here. But as I read through this chapter, I realized there's some principles we can learn from Daniel. And the character he showed in handling crises and crises that was going on in his life. Now, I just do want to remind you, though, as both the review and kind of the introductory thought to, as I said last week, the lesson is really more review than anything. But what's important to remember as you do read through the book of Daniel, whether you read through it on your own or as we talk about it, even in the lessons we're going through in this series, and that is the fact that as, as the rulers of Babylon brought Daniel and his friends over, that based on the education they were trying to give them, that they probably in part, a major part, were wanting to show Daniel and his friends that their guides were greater than the Jews and ultimately our God, the Lord God Jehovah. That's an important point to remember as you go through and read through the book of Daniel because what we see in the book of Daniel then is God using Daniel and his friends to ultimately show and prove to the rulers of Babylon and everybody else in Babylon that, yeah, even though you've got the Jews in captivity, I'm still God. And I am still the only God. I am still the Lord God, Jehovah, and there is no one greater than me. And we see that in that story, this story in chapter 2, and we see this in other stories as well. But as we get into chapter 2, I mentioned the fact, talking about Daniel and the character he showed in this crisis he faced. Well, what is the crisis that he faced? Well, we need to read the first 12 verses here of Daniel 2 to at least get the context of what's going on and try to help in understanding what this crisis is. So starting in verse 1, chapter 2, it says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. Now let me just mention briefly, there's some debate about exactly what this means in the second year of his reign. Is that Jewish counting or is that... Babylonian counting, if you will. There's some debate about this. Is this in the middle of 
Daniel's three years of education that we read about last week are the end. We really don't know for sure about that, but more than likely, Daniel's still only about 18 or so here, no matter what the meaning of that phrase is when this takes place. But Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. That's how they would normally answer the king. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. There are other versions use other words. Just know that's not a pleasant thought, what he's saying here. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answer the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. Well, the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they did not, they did not live among them. And they did not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So he followed the story, right? King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Now what we don't know is, does he not remember the dream? It's at least possible he does not remember the dream. And so he's counting on his wise men, the group, the astrologers and others that's mentioned there to come in and not just tell him the interpretation of the dream, but tell him what the dream was. Seems a little unreasonable, doesn't it? But you see, these wise men, these astrologers, they actually boasted and privately and talk about how they were in touch with their God. You see, dreams back then for those in Babylon and, and that culture, they believed those dreams came from their guides. And so the astrologers would be able to interpret the, the dreams because they had that kind of connection to their guides. They would boast about that. And so... In some ways, it's not an unreasonable request from Nebuchadnezzar to say to them, Hey, if you are so much in touch with your guides, you ought to be able to tell me what I dreamed anyway as well. So it's not completely unreasonable, perhaps. There's also a good chance that these wise men came from, and Nebuchadnezzar kind of inherited from his father. And so maybe he's seeing this as an opportunity to get rid of them. We really don't know for sure. What we do know is these wise men asked for more time, obviously. And history tells us something that's interesting about this, is perhaps why they wanted to need, ask and needed more time. History tells us that what these Babylonian wise men will, would do is when they heard dreams and they would interpret them, and they would actually keep what they called a dream manual, where they would go and they would record dreams from different people, and they would write down these dreams, and then write down what happened to them in their life to see what happened to them following their dreams. And so they recorded these manuals, these dreams, and then they used those situations to basically interpret dreams in the future. Does that make any sense? So, you know, I have a dream, just giving you a rich or rough example, not a great example. I have some dream, I tell it to them, and then five years later, I, we lose our house. And so they would go and write down and say, Here's Bobby had this dream five years later. He lost his house. That must be what that dream means. A situation comes up like that in the future, they would use that to interpret. So they had these books of manuals, these dream manuals. They needed more time to go back and consult it. It's similar to our day and time to lawyers and all the 
all the interpretations they have in courts of the rulings that come down, they would come back to check the history of that. It's similar to that. So that's why they're asking for more time. But he's having this dream, and what he's ordered does seem unreasonable. I do tell you, know, that we get a, at least a hint a little bit later on of what Nebuchadnezzar may be dreaming about. In verse 29, as Daniel starts to tell him his dream and interpretation, we find it said that it says, that As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. Apparently what's happening is Nebuchadnezzar was having one of those late nights, maybe he can't sleep, and he starts thinking about what's going to happen in the future. What's going to happen to my kingdom after I die? What's it going to look like? gets anxious about that. Y'all ever have those late nights you stay up worrying about the future? Seems to be what Nebuchadnezzar is happening. And so he, it, the dream is so rough, though, whether he can remember it or not, he gets to the point he has sleepless nights from then on, being anxious about it. There's a lot more we can say about that, but let me just make a side point here that I think it's important for us to realize and remember. The Nebuchadnezzar here shows and gives another example that there's no amount of power or prestige, or riches that can remove anxiety from our life. Cannot happen. And that's what we crave so often, isn't it? Don't we think if we get more money, if we, if we win this, if we win that, everything's going to be okay. And this is just another example of the fact of someone that was the most powerful man there was at the time that still faced great anxieties in his life. So here was the crisis that came up. Because as we're going to read in just a moment, Daniel and his men get thrown into this group of the wise men that might get killed and would get killed. So how did Daniel handle the crisis? I think there are principles here that we can learn from in our lives to handle crises that come our way. One of the ways we see Daniel and how he handled the crisis is simply the fact that Daniel remained calm and confident. Daniel remained calm and confident even as this crisis was presented. Reading the verse 13 of, of Daniel chapter 2 as we continue on here. It says, So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. You see what Daniel does here? First of all, he approaches the wisdom, the, the commander of the king's guard, he approaches them with wisdom and tact. There's a sense of, of calmness with Daniel there. He didn't go into panic mode when he went to, to him and said, what's going on and why are me and my friends included in this? We shouldn't be included in this. If I was Daniel, that's probably what I would have been doing and arguing. But he remained calm, even in this crisis. This past week, Danny went out. Danny went with us to Atlanta this weekend, and he and I were going back and forth about whether or not we needed another vehicle to take or in a vehicle to take on the trip. We finally found one, thought that would be good. It was in Montgomery. It was Thursday afternoon. We looked online and got a confirmation, so we're good. So Heather and I get in the car late Thursday afternoon to go up to Montgomery to get the rental vehicle, and we get to the location. I'm not going to tell you where. almost did. We got, went to the location and got there, and they said, nope, we're all out. I wish I could tell you I remained calm. Uh, hopefully I wasn't too bad. But needless to say, I wasn't very happy to hear we are that we had driven to Montgomery and about to drive back without knowing what we had come from. Daniel, though, shows a calmness here. But he also shows confidence here. Do you see what he did? Nebuchadnezzar was fiery mad, right? He makes this order, but Daniel goes back in and talks to King Nebuchadnezzar. There's a sense of confidence about him there, isn't there? 
And here's what's ironic. The wise men, the astrologers, and asked Nebuchadnezzar for more time. He didn't want to give them more time. Daniel asked for more time, and he gives Daniel more time. How come? Maybe, just maybe, it was a sense of calmness, confidence that Daniel presented to him that the others did not. We don't know for sure. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar at this point had already seen and had a sense of who Daniel was. Remember back in chapter 1 and verse 17, after talking about the, the nutrition crisis that Daniel went through that we talked about last week, and at the end of that, when it says, verse 17, talking about Daniel and his friends, to these four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Maybe this gave Daniel the confidence that he needed as well. We really don't know for sure. Maybe it gave Nebuchadnezzar confidence. But what we do know is that he showed confidence and calmness here in this crisis. And that's something we can learn from and make sure that we remember. A second principle we see here in Daniel, how he handled this crisis, is that Daniel spent time in earnest prayer. Daniel spent time in earnest prayer. Reading on in verse 17 of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel records, and he says here, and I and apologize, it's not going to be the same as that. I, I've got apparently misplaced my sheet, but that's on. So I'm going to read from the English Standard Version for right now. So then Daniel went to his house and made the matters known to Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, his companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he told them to seek to plead mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions may not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel went to his friends, went to them and said, Let's make sure, here's a crisis, here's what's going on, here's what you need to know. We're, we've been thrown into this, and if, with this crisis, we can lose our life. So here's what we need to do. We need to go and spend earnest time, time in earnest prayer. That was the first thing Daniel went to do. See, if history is right, all the astrologers, what they did is they went to the dream manuals. Daniel and his friends went to God first. And that's why Daniel wanted more time. He wanted more time because he knew even though he had, had this confidence, he knew that even in this situation, every situation, every crisis needed time spent in prayer, in earnest prayer. And by the way, isn't Jesus an example of that for us as well? In spite of everything Jesus knew and the confidence that he had, didn't he spend time in earnest prayer? There's not much more earnest prayer than what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does earnest prayer mean? Earnest prayer, the term literally means to be in one, one's right mind. It's being self-controlled in such a way, to be in right mind in such a way for you to be able to pray, and to pray earnestly to God. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4 Verse 7 talks about this in the New Living Translation. Reading from there, it says, The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. What's Peter saying here? Peter's saying even in all the, the chaos that might be going on, even the crisis that might be going on, as he's writing to people, as they're going through hardships and going through difficult times, he's saying it doesn't matter what is going on around us. We need to make sure that we remember to pray. And that we spend time in earnest prayer. Another discipline that we see here from Daniel is that Daniel put his trust in God. He put his trust in God. Well, how do we know that Daniel put his trust in God? Well, we see that Daniel put his trust in God in that what happened after he spent time in prayer First, Daniel apparently went to sleep. There's something to be said about the fact that Daniel went to sleep himself and a peace enough to be able to go to sleep. Because in verse 19, what we read is that the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night as he was sleeping. 
And then notice what Daniel did. Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He, he takes care of, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read and can't read it well here. Kings and others as well. He goes on to say, go to the next slide, J.D., if you would for me. And leadership and his discerning for sure. Reading again from the English Standard Version. Verse 23, to you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and you now made known to, you, to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. And just stop here and say for a second, when did Daniel make this prayer? Did he pray this after he went to King Nebuchadnezzar? Knowing that the vision that he had received from God was true and accurate? No. He praised God before he went to King Nebuchadnezzar. He trusted what God had shown him was indeed from God. It was the vision. It was the interpretation. Then picking up verse 24, Then Daniel went to Arioch, and the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king. And I will interpret his dream for him. Then even later on, after Daniel does go to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar talks about and really praises Daniel in, in some ways, and, and Arioch actually says, I found the one that can tell you this dream. I found you the one that can tell you this interpretation. Daniel replied, verse 27, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner, can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Daniel put his trust in God. He praised God. He gave glory to God. He was humble in doing so, but he did all this even before he shared with Nebuchadnezzar what his, Daniel's own vision was about what the dream was that Nebuchadnezzar had and the interpretation. I mean, I really want you to think about that. I mean, can you imagine having even a good friend come up to you and said, you know, I had a dream last night. Can you tell me what the dream is? Could you imagine being confident trying to tell that person what the dream was? It's not going to happen, is it? But Daniel still trusted God. God gave him the accurate dream, the accurate interpretation. And he went and shared it. With Nebuchadnezzar. We need to put our trust in God, even and especially in times of crisis. Caleb Cochran was here with us at BBS a couple weeks ago and taught our, one of our adult classes and talked about how God calmed the storms and the seas and talked about how even the stones and others submit to God and listen to God. He made a great point in that he said when he looked through Scripture, all of God's created beings submit to God except one. You know who it is? It's us humans. Animals submit to God. Stones submit to God. Nature submits to God. Us humans are the ones that don't always fully submit to God. Why is that? There may be lots of reasons why that is, but maybe, just maybe one of them is because we don't fully trust God. And you say, what well, Bobby Daniel had a straight vision from God. He had a straight word from God that made it easier to trust God. Yeah, I really hate that we don't have revealed word from God anymore today, don't you? We don't have Jesus that came to earth who is God's word. We don't have written word anymore. And no, maybe it doesn't give answers to every specific situation we have going on. Understand that there sure are a lot of principles that can help us as we go through crisis. And deal with tough times in our life. Things like Jesus even saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus saying, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Jesus talking about and telling us to forgive others. Even living with gratitude at all times. Paul talking about 1 Thessalonians when he says, be joyful always, pray always. Always give thanks for this is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus. You know what's sad is, or it's amazing actually, is many times 
that the things we learn in Scripture, that there is even earthly wisdom and science that proves him right. Adam Ellis, who's here today, one of our former students and is a minister and been a minister for a number of years now, he actually spoke at summer celebration in Lipscomb a couple years ago in gratitude. I didn't get to go. Adam has no idea that I listened to him, but I did. But one of the things that Adam's brought out in his point on the gratitude was actually a study that he'd done and research that he'd done on it. And I think I'm remembering right, Adam, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I think it was Dr. Robert Image, a professor in California. And kind of paraphrasing it, I've actually shared this with our church family before, but kind of paraphrasing what he said was that those who practice gratitude in their life, it has positive and lasting results every single time. Is that accurate? That was what the research showed. And what's amazing is we have a tendency to trust earthly research more than we trust the God of heaven. But I'm thankful for that research because it does help build our faith. And let us know even things like when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Why? And the peace of God guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus will give you the peace that goes beyond understanding. It may not solve problems, but boy, when we have the peace in our life, we have calmness in our life, when we pray for wisdom and know that we can trust that God's going to give us wisdom, as James talks about in James 1, what a difference it does make. One last principle of how we can see from Daniel as far as him handling his crisis is Daniel shows compassion. Verse 24, Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, as we read earlier, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the dream, and I will interpret his dream for him. I think it's remarkable that Daniel shows he cared even about people that probably didn't think highly of him. Because let's be honest, Daniel made these people look bad, didn't he? And we know throughout the story of Daniel, they did things, and as they move along, to try to make Daniel and his friends ultimately look bad. But even in that, Daniel still showed compassion toward them. He didn't want bad things to happen to them. And folks, as a church, we need to learn and hear that ourselves. No matter what others say about us, no matter th what those in our cultures think about Christianity, we are called on to be compassionate to everyone. Uh, Jesus showed that, didn't he? He showed compassion to the Samaritan. He showed compassion to the woman caught in adultery. We need to make sure we show compassion to all people, regardless of whether they believe what we believe or look at things the same way we do or say bad things about us. We're still called on to call, show compassion to all people. These great principles, I think, can handle, help us as we handle crisis. Remaining calm, obviously spending time in prayer, that is first and foremost. Putting our trust in God and showing compassion. Quickly here as we come to close, just a couple of concluding thoughts that we can take as well. One of those is the fact that Daniel's character, I believe, gave him credibility Indeed, gave him credibility. Chapter 5, verse 10 and 12 is another story a little bit later, just a couple chapters over. This is the context of the handwriting on the wall that many of us are familiar about. And, and they're trying to figure out who in the world can interpret this handwriting on the wall. And verse 10 says, A queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came to the banquet hall. This is probably a number of years later, by the way, when Daniel was older. Some even think he may have been semi retired at this point. In time, this is not Nebuchadnezzar anymore that's having this dream. It's um, King Belshazzar that's having this, or the handwriting of that dream, the handwriting happened to him. But it says, The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. This is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge 
and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. The way we handle character, our crisis, the character we show, in bad times and good times, it goes a long way to giving us credibility, to giving us integrity. People remember it. And along those lines, the way Daniel had character in crisis, it shined a light for others to see the character of God. Daniel's character shined a light for others to see the character of God. Verse 47, later in chapter 2, after Daniel shares the dream and interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar, it says, The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Folks are paying attention to how we live. And that's true at all times. We also need to remember, though, that folks are paying attention to how we handle difficult times in our life, how we handle a crisis. And it does give us an opportunity that if we stay calm, if we show high character even in times of crisis, I believe God will be glorified and we will have the opportunity to shine a light for others to see. This morning as we come to a close, and maybe there's some that are going through crisis in your life, and you're having a hard time with it, maybe because your relationship with God is not what it needs to be, it's not what it should be. Maybe some here who are not even in a covenant relationship with Jesus, and you want Jesus to be that friend that you can take everything to in prayer that is there with you, and we need in our lives. And if you're not in a covenant relationship with him, but you have faith that you believe Jesus who he claims to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, and you're ready to commit your life to Him, to enter that covenant relationship. We love to witness you be buried with Christ in baptism, to be raised a new person, confessing that belief, having your sins forgiven, and committing your life to live for Him. If you desire to do that, we'd love to help you with that this morning. For most of us who have already done that, maybe there are some that are going through times of crisis, and you need prayers in a private way during all this. We continue understand that, I can get one of the elders, myself or Rick or anyone really love to pray with you. And maybe just in a public way, any prayers from your church family to help you during this time. We can help you in any way. We encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing.